afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much for coming to hear me speak about Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust. In October 1908, the first Model T was produced by Ford. Why is that relevant? Well, Scottish Mortgage had its beginnings in granting mortgages over Malaysian rubber plantations to service this new step change in demand for rubber from the Model T. Indeed, going forward from 1908 over the next 20 years, Ford would go on to sell 15 million units and change the way General Assembly worked. One of the things that's noticeable is how difficult it is to see these type of changes come when you're amidst them. So the photograph on the left-hand side, so you can see, is Fifth Avenue in 1903. Photograph on the right, 10 years later, 1913. Bear in mind when I said the first Model T came off the production line. In 1903, there was one internal combustion engine on Fifth Avenue. A decade later, but a considerably shorter period from the beginning of the Model T, there's one horse-drawn vehicle. When you see these accelerating trends, it can be very hard to predict exactly when they will reach critical mass. But actually, very often, you can predict the general path. And broadly speaking, that's what we try to do for Scottish Mortgage. We simply do what we've always done. We aggregate savers' capital. We invest it around the world in the best businesses we can find in any industry, in any country, looking for the few standout growth companies that are offering us something extraordinary that means they can be a multiple of their size today over the coming years because their business fundamentals, the operating economics of their business, combined with the markets they're either creating or addressing, are better than what exists today. And therefore, they have the potential to produce the standout returns that recent academic research shows really drives long-run equity market returns. Now, you cannot be all things to all people. There are a lot of very intelligent people trying to time short-term markets. There's a lot of money going into trying to time short-term market moves. We don't think we have a competitive advantage in doing that, so we simply don't. We only look to invest in businesses, actual investment, based on their fundamentals for the long term because we believe they have a chance of offering us the asymmetry of returns, looking at the capital we put at risk by that investment and what it might give us if they do succeed in their extraordinary ambitions. We believe that you have to be constructive in your support for companies. Expecting a company to be able to execute on their business plan in a smooth fashion over 13-week cycles is frankly unrealistic in the real world. Yet on Wall Street, that's exactly what we try to demand. Management teams will see bumps in the road. Some of that will be of their own making. Some of that will be circumstances. But in the long run, if they really have the ability to execute, if they're prepared to put capital to work to do that, then that's a very interesting proposition for us, and those are the type of businesses we look for. From our own business, what we've done is try to think of our own competitive advantages. We're now a FTSE 100 company, as you've heard, and we use the benefit of that scale and leverage our long-term relationship with Bailey Gifford. And Bailey Gifford was created back in 1909 to manage the assets of Scottish Mortgage. And I'm proud to say we've managed the trust right throughout its 100-year-plus history. We use those two things to bring down costs for shareholders. Because we know as investors, bringing down your costs really matters because costs erode long-term compounding returns like nothing else. Our ongoing charges are 37 basis points. We've introduced a tiered management fee scale as the trust has grown, so that as it continues, hopefully, to grow, then the ongoing charges will come down again. And we believe that's really powerful. An investment trust may be a vehicle that's been around for 150 years, but it's flexibility where we can invest a closed pool of capital, but you as shareholders or prospective investors can buy shares on the exchange, and we're very liquid. We're a FTSE 100 company. We support that with a liquidity policy gives us a unique balance that allows us to invest in companies, regardless of whether they are public or private. 
So on to the most interesting stuff, the portfolio companies. This graph shows the share price of Apple. I'm guessing everybody in the room is familiar with the company. In 2007, Apple released the first iPhone. As hard as it is to believe, we didn't really have successful portable smart devices until just over a decade ago. Now I'm guessing pretty much everybody in this room will have at least one form of portable smart device with them. We invested in the beginning of 2009 when it looked decidedly optimistic to be buying into a consumer goods company that was threatening to charge hundreds of dollars for a cell phone. We thought that actually there was a chance that Apple had created something that was extraordinary. This wasn't just something you would recycle your Nokia into or your Blackberry into. We disagreed with Mr. Ballmer of Microsoft that people wouldn't buy a smartphone without a, a handheld keyboard. The keyboard being on screen seemed to be an area that was too far to go back in 2007. But actually, when you looked at the analysis that they had something truly valuable, you could predict that there was a chance, we're looking at probabilities, not certainties here, that if they did succeed, they would sell a lot more units, they'd be very valuable, they'd have a cash flow dynamic that very attractive from a cohort of loyal users. Now, it doesn't come in a smooth line. It's not easy to predict exactly when. What we're talking about here is looking at the trends. For Scottish Mortgage, we're looking for those extraordinary growth companies. So there comes a point when Apple became the biggest company in the world where we sold. We don't fall in love with our investments. It doesn't mean we think Apple's not a good company. It's an excellent company. It just doesn't, as far as we can see, have sufficient likelihood of a new addressable market that means from 2016 where we sold, we could see a fundamental reason in the long run that it becomes a multiple three, four, five times its size from there. It means it's suitable for other investors. Scottish Mortgage isn't trying to do all things to all people. Today, the largest holding in our portfolio is Amazon. Again, a company I'm guessing most people are very familiar with. For us, all the talk about, well, isn't Amazon hugely overvalued? Well, no, because it doesn't let its earnings drop through to the bottom line, the last figure, as it were. What it does is take cash flows from one area of its business and reinvest them. Now, so long as that reinvested capital is helping the business fundamentally grow, and Amazon's track record in this regard is pretty impressive. It's read, led by what we believe to be one of the foremost investor minds in the world today, Jeff Bezos, then we're very happy for companies to keep that capital and reinvest it in their future growth. Context also matters here. So you'll hear things saying, well, Amazon is a dominant giant. And it's true, it's half of all US retail sales online. But it looks a lot more modest when you start to look at it as retail in general, if you just treat it as another store group. It is 5% of retail sales as a whole in the US. Actually, when you look at revenues, Walmart at $514 billion of revenue last year, compared with Amazon's mere $233 billion, starts to put it back into context. And that's before you think of some of the extraordinary businesses it's developing around its cloud software, AWS service, which is a higher margin business growing extremely strongly, even in the context of Amazon. This is growing at north of 50% per annum providing a service that it doesn't make sense for companies today to do themselves, um, that we think is truly attractive. So, so long as we can still see for Amazon or any of our other holdings, how they become a multiple of their size for where they are today, based on their fundamental operating economics and the markets they're going after, that their management teams are aligned with ours on, on short-term Wall Street targets over the next two to three years, but are there for the long duration preferably they own the same shares as we do, so we can see that clear alignment, then we're very happy to put our investors' capital into them and remain patient and supportive shareholders. What we've also seen in recent years is that actually companies are staying private for longer because Wall Street's demands for those earnings multiples mean that they're not being allowed to invest enough in their future. And this is exactly the reason that Daniel Ek, who created and runs Spotify, 
cited for not becoming a public company earlier. Indeed, when Spotify listed, it was just under $30 billion of market valuation. And this really matters because if you're a public market equity investor, you cannot access that value creation. What we at Scottish Mortgage are trying to do is give you that opportunity within our low cost structure. There's no extra management charge here. There's no two and 20 for doing this. We believe that if Spotify was a public company, we would absolutely be considering it for this portfolio. So there's no reason given our current structure that allows us that flexibility where we have a closed pool of investment capital that we shouldn't do just that for Scottish Mortgage and our shareholders. We don't have a finite lifespan, so we can offer companies better patient capital than the equivalent private equity fund that will have to sell out at the end of its life. And when companies choose to go public, and Spotify did that without raising any additional capital, then the likelihood is that if we still think the business case is intact, actually we'll be investing more of our broader client funds or indeed those of Scottish Mortgage. And we think this is an extraordinary business changing the dynamics of the music industry today. Similarly, Airbnb, again, another company that I think will be familiar to most, if not all of you. It's still a private company, whereas Spotify is now public. But actually, what this really does is challenge the hotel chains. If you were a public market investor in the likes of Marriott and other hotels, you needed to understand what was happening at Airbnb over the decade since it was created. I've added some statistics here, but I think my favorite statistic is that there are over 4,000 castles that you can rent an Airbnb, presumably some of those in Scotland. There are 2,400 tree houses that you can rent on Airbnb, presumably fewer of those are in Scotland. But actually what this really matters is that this is about access and the democratization of getting access to these private companies that are not early stage businesses. It's hard given that Airbnb has more rooms to book than any hotel chain on their site in a given night. It's hard to argue that this is a early stage, VCT, unduly risky private company. This is something that if it was a public company, you would absolutely be looking at as a growth investor. Actually, some of the things that have powered these companies are now spreading into new areas. So one of the common themes that you'll have noticed is they're all about the digital connected world. Companies like Google, which is in the portfolio, obviously, as Alphabet, Facebook, and Amazon in the West, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, have created a new paradigm, a digitally connected world. The next wave of companies that we think are really interesting are building their fundamental business models off the back of the existence of that new technology. This is not about investing in the technology per se, it's investing in the better business models that it's permitted that are challenging sleepy incumbents that aren't willing to put their capital to work to acknowledge this change. Give you some context, the company on the left hand side is called Meituan, I don't know if anybody's heard of it, it's a Chinese company. And it's really a way of delivering services online. It delivers 21 million meals per day in China. For context, the largest US equivalent delivers just under 450,000 meals in a day. Meituan's best customers order 21 meals a week. That is an extraordinary opportunity and we think it's being underappreciated by people who don't have the same dynamics in their market. Tesla. I don't know how many of you have already asked my colleagues downstairs about this stock. It's certainly one that we get asked most about. It is completely one that divides opinion. Our point is not that this is a perfect company. Our point is that the asymmetry of investing in this company runs in your favor as a long-term patient investor. It doesn't mean they will definitely succeed. It doesn't mean they're perfect. It means that this is Ford, changing the way assembly is done, changing the powertrains of vehicles. If you can grow your fundamental production numbers like that, yes, it takes a lot of capital. Yes, your capital is at risk when you're investing in it, but the potential for returns, and we've already made a multiple of our initial investment from 2013 when we first held the company, if you can see your fundamental business grow at this rate, is extraordinary. 
If Tesla succeeds in even a fraction of its real ambitions to become the largest company in the world, we will make a very healthy return for our shareholders. And we think of that in terms of the likelihood of them succeeding. Well, they're certainly putting enough capital to, uh, to work in this area. This isn't about producing prototypes. This is about producing production lines. When you combine that with what they're doing in static battery storage and solar cells, where you're looking at the advantage they have in autonomous vehicles, we think this is absolutely appropriate within the mix of a diversified global portfolio that invests in all sorts of companies all around the world. Elon Musk is a genius. He's also not the easiest man on the planet to work with. That is exactly the willingness to accept both the uncertainty and the real world imperfections that we believe as fundamental investors in companies, you must be prepared to think about. Healthcare. So this is another area that's really changing. We're just on the cusp of it. Our largest holding would be the full human genome sequencing machine maker Illumina, which is equivalent to buying the spades and shovels as things to the railroads come around. Actually, the next stage will be in changing healthcare full stop to much more personalized medicine. And we invest in companies from Denali, which is looking at neurodegenerative diseases, looking for treatments for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, sadly two very large and addressable markets right through to Grail, a company that was spun out of Illumina, which we got chance to invest in as a private business because we've been long and loyal shareholders in Illumina, that is the, going for the lofty ambition of developing a simple blood test to you and I for all cancers, stage one and two, which will dramatically change survival rates and the cost of treatment. Again, they might not succeed in all of that ambition, but if they do, this is a huge potential market and we think it looks like an attractive investment. Sometimes they're more prosaic. HeartFlow is looking at machine learning um, to diagnose coronary artery disease. And Zipline, which is in the bottom right, is a company looking at how you deliver blood supplies in Rwanda when the infrastructure, the roads, make them nearly impassable for most of the year and the rest of the time you just can't get through. They're using autonomous drones to drop blood supplies to far-flung clinics, which is really changing the financial dynamics of the healthcare industry and we think is really interesting long term. So how do we think about it? Well, we don't think you'll be surprised to hear that risk is measured truly on the long-term basis relative to a position in an industry over a short-run basis of share prices. We think it is, what is your capital actually invested in? And are we going to be wrong in our investment decisions? What's your capital at risk? And these are the different areas that drive the portfolio. We've talked about online retail. We've talked about changing media habits a little bit, transformational healthcare, Shifting energy generation and consumption, that's Tesla. And a number of other areas which we think are really interesting that offer some of these really attractive companies, that that is your diversification. And that's what really matters. If you're prepared to be patient, long-run company of fundamentals will actually win out. Now, I said at the beginning, it's not possible to be all things to all people. Scottish mortgage is suited to those of us who share our patient actual investing approach. Our point is there's an awful lot of people trying to beat the market in these sort of segments. That actually in investing, if you want differentiated returns, you have to be doing something different to everything else. You also have to have different information sources. When you're looking at a company over the sort of time frame as we are, five years and beyond, Quarterly earnings don't really matter so much. What matters is how a company is allocating capital. What does the development of the market they're looking at really look like over the next five to ten years? None of this, I should say, is possible to do with a nice clean spreadsheet that will come up with a single price. What we do is look at multiple scenarios for the companies we invest in, what could happen, that asymmetry of investing that I've talked about, what that means is that you can, in the right companies who are able to fundamentally grow their operating businesses, make a multiple of your money over time. And you should think about your capital as the capital at risk that you have invested, which means that your downside is 100% in the capital you've invested, which sounds very scary, but your upside is many multiples of that. And then if you're patient and you spread that across a diversified portfolio, then you start to look at these sort of return profiles. Because fundamentally... If you have businesses that are able to be those standout few businesses, um, then that's where you stand the best chance of driving returns. Um, for those who are interested, if you Google Arizona State University, there's really interesting research on this by a Professor Heinrich Bessenbinder, 
uh, it's available that looks at all stock market returns over the last 90 years, which is a pretty good data set starting in uh, 1926, which captures a very wide spread of markets. And what that shows is that out of just under 25,000 possible companies you could have invested, 90 odd produced you half the returns available from investing in US equities over and above giving your money to the US government. Just about 1,000 firms actually produce the total return if you rank them in order of performance over that period. The rest did a little bit worse, a little bit better, actually ended up as a net result of zero and you'd have been better off giving your money to the US government. If you are prepared to be long-run investors, if you are prepared to actually invest in businesses, there's a really interesting opportunity that not many people are trying to pursue. So I'll leave you with the summary of Scottish Mortgage. I'm conscious that my time is almost up. We are on stand 36 downstairs. If you do have any questions, please do come and talk to us. I'd be delighted to answer them. Um, I'll leave you with three thoughts of what we think it means to be an actual investor, which is be patient, be long-term in a world where not many investors are prepared to do that. Also, be optimistic. It's really easy to find the downside case, but actually in the few companies that really move long-run equity returns, it's being optimistic, it's understanding what the iPhone really meant in 2007 and just how big it could be if it wasn't just another phone replacement that actually drives fundamental companies. It's understanding the changes coming through in our world today, be it in healthcare, in travel, same thing is happening in education. What's that going to mean? The other thing which is a bit more downbeat is there are a number of companies that are not investing heavily enough to compete with these changes coming who have new competitors just like Marriott and Airbnb, who haven't put that capital to work, who've been patiently returning it to shareholders to meet demand for income, and yet in the long run, losing on capital because those businesses don't keep up with the changes is what's really gonna to matter to investors. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much for your time today.